just to get an idea of the demographics here, uh, could how many of you guys are students? Raise your hand, like hi. So most of you. How many uh, staff members, faculty members at Alto? Okay, great. Uh, how many of you are developers in one way or the other? Excellent. All right. Very good. Um, and how many of you are either currently entrepreneurs, want to be entrepreneurs, or are looking at that as a, as a possible career? Okay. Good. We're getting there. A nice, uh, one other nice thing that I can't test uh, like this, but I noticed looking at the sign-ups that almost exactly 50% of the audience is, had, does not have a Finnish last name. So Finnish or Swedish, so I assume both of those. So we have a very multinational crowd here, and uh, I, think, I think it's going to make for a nice setup. So uh, the general idea here would be is I, I, I'm going to kick things off with a couple questions, uh, and, uh, and, and then I want to open it up very quickly to you guys. And, um, really encourage you to, to, to come up with something interesting to ask. And uh, I'm sure Linus will find, find something interesting to a answer. I'll preempt him with one thing, by the way, is uh, I think he'll tell you that he's not an entrepreneur. Correct. <laughs> he's an engineer. And I think it's a really interesting, this whole, the, the whole history of Linus is, uh, is, is really interesting as it relates not only to entrepreneurial uh, stuff, but basically to getting things done and building something big with high ambition. So let me, let me start off. Um, I, did a, I did a search on Google Video of Linus Torvalds and I got 1.45 million hits. <laughs> so I could, and I went, went and watched, the, looked a few of those to figure out what are the questions that have been asked already and what uh, uh, might still be left to ask. And I'm sure that I uh, obviously don't hit all of it. Also uncovered a great page with uh, Linus Torvalds quotes, which is uh, a, a treasure trove of interesting stuff. Okay. Uh, really recommend you guys to take a look I'm at it. I'm leaving now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll pinpoint it. No, I'm not going to pinpoint those. But, but um, um, I, guess, I guess my idea, or the idea here would be to Try to try to talk about some things that are interesting from our kind of burgeoning uh, developer hacker community here. That's also starting to look more and more at not necessarily going to big companies that may, for example, uh, not be having as many jobs anymore. Um, uh, I don't know. I'm just just guessing. Um, uh, but also for for roles in in any kind of enterprise. Uh, and government even. So I think uh, we really try to look at the idea of, of, of entrepreneurship is more deep down as something that's kind of driven w from within and it's, a w it's more of a way of thinking. Um, but uh, I, wanted, I wanted to ask a little bit about the, the beginning of Linux. I mean, I know I've uh, been asked about it many times before, but, but what, what kind of fascinated me is that, that um, you know, a multi-hundred, probably multi-hundred billion dollar ecosystem was born basically in a bedroom in a probably cold, dark evening in, in, in Helsinki. <laughs> Maybe an overstatement, yeah. but, um, but, uh, but could, in, in, the, in, the, in the question kind of is this, um, you've said often that it's, it's a bit accidental that it came, became something so big, um, yet we're of course as a community trying to encourage big thinking and, and ambition. So, so maybe, um, could you just tell us a little bit about what was uh, going on and what was kind of going through your head uh, as you were kind of taking the first step? So as Will already mentioned, I really don't see myself as an entrepreneur. Um, and I come from a background where I, even when I started Linux, I was 21 years old and I had basically programming half my life at that point. So I was in the situation where programming was a hobby, but it was almost a habit that I had made some bad mistakes uh, at times and bought some odd computers that were not very well supported. And as a result of that, I had gotten very used to the fact that you can't even buy ready-made programs. You have to write them yourself because uh, 
I started off with a VIC-20, which was actually fairly common, but it was co common at the time when it was not common to really buy stuff for it. So I started programming, then I switched to a computer that was very much unsuccessful, the Sinclair QL, that had a very small community, and again, that meant that there was never even a question of running programs that other people wrote. If you didn't write your own programs, you didn't do anything with that computer, pretty much. So I had been constantly just doing programming all my life, and I was looking for a new project, and they all ended up being things I used myself, plus the occasional game that was so bad that I would never use it. <laughs> so, but usually it was things like, I wrote my own assembler, I wrote my own editor, I wrote my own tool for doing this and that. And uh, I came to Helsinki University, found out about Unix, and decided I want to have Unix at home. And how hard can it be? I mean, you, you really, but you really come from that like history of saying, hey, I always write my own tools. And I mean, I actually tried to find commercial tools again. And this time it was on a regular PC, so you actually would expect that by now, 91, you can actually finally, in my life, I wouldn't have to write my own tool because I could buy it. But it turns out I couldn't because it was expensive as hell. And uh, it was geared towards literally banks. I mean, the, if you looked at Unix on PCs back in the 90s, the main users were, were banking applications and things like that. And for some reason, when you sell into that market, you don't you add three digits at the end of the, or of the number just because banks is where the money is, obviously, right? So it was not geared towards my kind of use where I wanted it for my own personal use. Uh, so it wasn't planned. It was very much accidental, and it literally was a question of, hey, I've done my tools all my life. I'll do this too. Interesting. What, what was the... Uh can you identify the first point where you, you thought that there might be some level of commercial opportunity? I can identify the first point where I said, what, they're selling that? Yes. <laughs> uh, it, it actually happened very early on. Uh, like I remember, I think it was Byte Magazine in like January 92 or something like that. I mean, this was really rough. This was Linux 0 0.12 and uh, there was an ad for selling, uh, what was the first, I, was it SLS that was the first one or something, where they basically sold a service of, you could buy seven high-density floppy disks, I think. And it was, I forget how much it was. And the only reason I actually know about this was uh, I didn't get that bite myself. But Andrew Tannenbaum, who we've had a few small discussions before, <laughs> he, he actually sent me the notice about this and asked me, was this really what you wanted to happen? And uh, I was like, yes, <laughs> and I don't know. Because uh, by then I had realized it wasn't really about the, the price, but that what I wanted to happen was easy availability of Unix, because that was what I had looked for and couldn't find. So in, in a sense, it was like, I, it was clear that Andrew Tannenbaum expected me to say, no, I wanted, uh, I wanted it to be free on the internet, and these people who are selling it are evil, but I was actually, hey, it's convenient to buy it if you have the 35 bucks or whatever it was. It was not a huge amount of money, but it wasn't like five bucks either. Uh, you, you can buy it on the floppy and not wait for seven days for it to download over a 300 baud modem or whatever. <laughs> so. um, how about um, early on, you know, you said you'd obviously been programming for some time, had some victories and some, some, some failures. I mean, can you identify the few kind of things you would have done differently very early, or, you know, and then the converse, the mistakes that were made as, as, as you started, let's say, building it and extending it. Really, the very early days, I have a hard time even imagining what I did that I could have done wrong. Uh, 
it really, none of my programming career was really planned. It was a passion for me. I started programming when I was so young that, that I read all these books about assembly language without really noticing. I did not, so kind of a background, I did not understand that assembly language was supposed to be the symbolic form of, of, of a machine code. So I always called what I wrote assembly language, even though what I actually wrote was the literal numbers. I wrote the machine code because I, I did not have an assembler. <laughs> so to me, assembly language was the data statements that had the numbers in them. That's how I started doing assembly language. And uh, anybody who actually knew what they were doing would have called that machine code and would have bought an assembler because they realized that's just stupid. But I didn't know what I was doing. So I literally for several years, including my first few months with the Motorola 68K, I would do the assembly by hand and actually write machine code. So, and that was just because I didn't know what I was doing. Right? So. How, how about as a, as, as, you know, then fast forward to the kind of Linux community starting to build um, in terms of management of the communi community. I mean, I think this is a, I guess Linux is known to be the biggest collaborative effort of mankind. I've read some, I think Wired called it or something well, like that. But obviously the management, how did, how did you get it going? So I actually think building the pyramids took a lot more planning than Linux yeah. because one of the things that I think is really interesting is how there was zero management, there was no logistics, there was no planning going on at any point. And what happened was through open source, people did what they were good at doing. So for example, I still don't maintain a website. I have never in my life done any web programming because I'm not interested. I think that kind of stuff is, you have MIS people to do that for you, right? I'm interested in programming. Uh, and, 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 <laughs> but there are people out there who, who they set up a website and do all the DNS magic and they can do it in their sleep because, I mean, that's what they do. And they don't even think of it as their job. It's just that something that they do on the side. And, uh, and the fir that's what happened when, when I put Linux out for FTP at the fir for the first time. I never figured out how to set up an FTP site, right? There was somebody who did it for me, so Ari Lemke. There was, uh, the whole, when business started happening, um, I didn't get into this for the business side. I wanted to do, again, programming. So when other people started selling Linux, I, Linux, I was like, yes! Now I can avoid caring about that side, too. Uh, I got out of, for the very early versions, I had to do my own programs in user space just because, I mean, I was the only person there. So for the first couple of months, I would release not just my kernel sources, but I would also release two disk images. And two disk images because the first disk image was the binary version of the kernel just so you could write it to the boot floppy and the other disk image contained your root file system. There was no init, there was no init. Init is too fancy. We only need a root shell and that's it. That's how real men do things, right? <laughs> and, and then somebody else came along and said, hey, this is stupid, you need to have init. And I was like, I do? And, and, and they just did it. And I stopped doing my disk images because, again, that was not what I was interested in. So the, the real power of open source, as far as I'm concerned, well, one of them, is that different people are good at different things and different people have different interests. And what open source really allows is that you don't even have to, you don't have to do the planning ahead of the logistics of setting up a company, and I realize this is about entrepreneurship, and you should set up a company, and you should know that you need an MIS person, and you need an executive assistant, and you need this and that, and, and you need to know how to balance the books. And as far as I'm concerned, the big advantage of open source is people do what they're good at, and they automatically gravitate towards that. If you're good at doing a website, you like doing that kind of things, you just do it. 
And, and that was very interesting, how there was no planning involved, because we didn't need to plan. It was all very organic. And that's actually how the development has worked, too, that we have, I mean, we've had some situations. We've had the source control management issues. We've had that happen a few times where we had really painful problems with maintaining the source code and, and having to, to completely change how we did things. And then we really had to do that in a planned manner. I mean, that, those did not happen randomly. But those are actually very few. Most of what happened in, in Linux development was very natural. The, the hierarchy we, we use for doing development, the fact that I work with 10 maintainers, roughly, 10 or 20 maintainers who all have their own sub areas, and they have their sub maintainers that they work with and they trust, and, and they have their portion of their sub areas, and we have this network. It wasn't like we designed that either. It's just happened because that's how people work. Uh, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of Linux development has been very, very much an organic process. Based on, I guess, trusting, uh, two-way trust between the parties. Yes, but uh, on the other hand, we, a lot of this is stuff that I analyze later, saying, hey, that's how it works, and I'm wondering why does it work that way. Yeah. But the fact is that is how people work, that the whole two-way trust between a small number of people. You trust your friends. You trust the people you've worked with for over time, and you don't trust a hundred people. I would never trust this audience. I mean, you're, you <laughs> neither, look like a shifty couple of guys and gals, right? You trust your close relatives. You trust five, ten, fifteen people. Even people who know a lot of people even when you have like a huge network of people you rely on, you maybe you're on LinkedIn and you have maxed out and you have 5,000 people in your network, how many of those do you trust? Ten, right? And that's kind of a basic issue that, that the way people work is, is, I think, inherent in our brain. I mean, the, the ten might be five for some people who are not that socially adept and it might be 50 for some that are but but at the same time the whole development process actually I think is uh, is again it works really well and I think one of the reasons it works really well is because it grew up we didn't try to enforce a certain hierarchy on it we used the hierarchy that just worked on its own and that turns out to be the right hierarchy Okay. Yeah, maybe my, my last question, and then uh, I'll turn it open to the audience. Um, obviously, a number of companies have been commercializing uh, Linux, and, and so my question would be, are you kind of satisfied with that end of the, the way it's been commercialized? It, it's um, okay. It's better than okay. I mean, it's, it was something that we were nervous about in the beginning. I mean, no question that when people started... And when I say we, I mean we. I mean, by then, it wasn't just me. It was these other engineers that had slowly started getting involved that whenever it was, I mean, long before IBM said, we'll put a billion dollars, we had the smaller companies. And, and people were worried that what would happen when commercial interests come in. And what happened was commercial interests suddenly want to sell Linux. So they want to do all the boring crap. They do... They do Q&A. They do, I mean, raise your hand if you want to do Q&A, <laughs> right? Yeah, not a, oh, there was a hand up there, but I think that was a joke, right? And, yeah, and, uh, or doing the whole user interfaces and trying to make it user friendly, that was not a high priority for the technical guys, especially early on. So the, the commercial interests actually forced Linux to become much more well balanced than that I mean, I'm sure we've had our clashes, but at the same time, without the commercial guys, Linux would never have gotten where it was, which is kind of sad looking at so many of the open source projects, especially at the time. I think that has changed, but especially at the time, a lot of the open source projects were very much anti-commercial, and there was a very strong, uh, we need to keep this free and pure, 
and companies are evil inherently and trying to sell it leads to bad problems. Uh, and uh, I think and hope that mentality is largely gone now, but it certainly was there early on. Great. All right. So um, I want to open up for some questions here. So uh, first one uh, spotted here. So you all and we have a couple of crystal. Uh, yep. Hi, Kirill Stemo. Uh, Linus, do you follow any uh, development of any new programming languages? Do you see any, any uh, language except C which is suitable for development of operating system? So I have to say, I'm kind of old-fashioned and I'm really interested. I, the reason I got into Linux in the, or operating systems in the first place was I really love hardware. I love tinkering with hardware. I'm, I, not in the sense that I'm a hardware person. I, giving me a soldering iron is a bad idea. But I, I like interacting with hardware from a software perspective. And uh, I have yet to see a language that comes even close to C in that respect. It's not just that C, you can use C to generate good code for hardware. It's that if you think like a computer, writing C actually makes sense. I mean, and, and I think the reason it works that way is the people who designed C designed it at, at a time when you, I mean, when compilers had to be simple and the language had to be kind of geared towards what the output was. So when I read C, I know what the, the assembly language will look like. And that is something I care about. The, I don't do a lot of programming myself anymore. I'm a technical lead person. I merge other people's code. But if you go and look in the Linux Git history and look at what I do, the last few months, the kind of code I've changed, I made sure our uh, file and path lookup takes as few cache misses as possible. And uh, all that code is C, but in order to really be able to, it's optimized at the level where I worry about single instructions kind of thing, and especially single cache misses. And I love doing that because that's, it's completely, I mean, to some degree people say you should not micro-optimize, but if what you love is micro-optimization, <laughs> that's what you should do. And we made sure our algorithms are, are, are good before we started the micro-optimization. So uh, I'm very proud of the fact that we look up path names way faster than anybody else, I guarantee it. Right? <laughs> and we can do it in parallel on a thousand CPU machine with no contention. I mean, that is something that has happened in the last 18 months, and that is impressive. I mean, you don't know how impressive it is <laughs> until, uh, until you've worked with that code for, I mean, I thought we'd never get there, but we're there now. So, so that's the kind of thing that really excites me from a technical standpoint. But. Next one back here. Well, you know, so I was about to ask my question already this morning, but I didn't have a chance. Uh, the Linux operating system is a standard de facto for the service platforms, mm -hmm. that's for sure. And even nowadays it's being used for some mobile devices and for many of network switches and so on, but it's never been, uh, never reached really an edge of being a competitor at the desktop level. Right. Why? Uh, this is my f personal failure point in Linux, that I started Linux as a desktop operating system and it's the only area where Linux hasn't completely taken over. And that, that just annoys the hell out of me. It's like you said it has had some success in the mobile operating system. Google's last numbers were 900,000 new activations every day. That's not some success, right? <laughs> right? Uh, so the desktop is really hard and I know why it's hard and it's still annoying that the desktop is basically the last holdout. The reason the desktop is so hard to crack is most consumers do not want to install an operating system on their machine. And that's not desktop centric. You don't want to install an operating system on your cell phone either, right? The reason Linux is successful on cell phones is not because you have 900,000 people downloading disk images and installing them on their cell phone every day. 
No, it's because it comes on the cell phone pre-installed. And that has never happened in the desktop market, and it's really hard to get it to happen. I mean, you, you get it, to, there have been companies that sell, like Dell, even in Finland, for, although I know they do it in, U, in the US, but I think they do it in Finland too. That especially if you're a big business and you want to run Linux, they will pre-install Linux on your desktop. But it's something where you have to specify that you want it, and they do it for a very limited portion of their of the machines they sell. So it's not something very common. And if you don't get the pre-installs, you're never going to get the desktop dominance. And uh, will that ever happen? Right now, the biggest hope is projects like Google Chromebook. And I have a first generation Chromebook, and the thing is slow and horrible. And when I get back home, uh, I think I should have a second generation Chromebook in the mail. Just because, for some odd reason, Google sends me these things. <laughs> so, so I will see, I'm, I, I know the hardware is so much better, so I'm no, no longer worried about the, the slow part. Uh, but this is something where I don't think you hit it on the, I know you don't hit it on the first generation, I don't think you hit it on the second. On the third generation, maybe, on the fourth, fifth, that's when we start talking. If you look at Android, it wasn't Android 1.0 that took off. So, so I'm, I'm hopeful that on the desktop it will happen, but the only way it happens is if we have pre-installs. And it's, it's not there today. Okay, over here, and then up at the top, next. So you said that you see yourself as a technical person. Mm -hmm. And as the Linux started growing, you must have had to deal with a lot of business-related things. No. And you never did? I never had to deal with a single business-related thing in Linux ever. Seriously. I had to deal with a lot of other things, but business-related things, I got queries and I just said, I, I don't care. We had, we had legal issues. We had the trademark issue was a huge waste of everybody's time and hugely pointless. We've had tons of these stupid things going on, but I don't think I've ever had a single business decision or business issue I had to get involved in. I um, one more thing, that when, when you were developing uh, Linux, you were a developer and you started it as a project. But as the system grew, your perspective about the operating system yeah. also changed. So how, how do you think, like how, how long did it take for you to grow up as, as, as who you are now? And like what's, what's the difference between that Linus and this Linus? I'm the wrong person to ask, and the reason is I, I mean, it's happened gradually, and I don't notice the difference, right? You could probably ask somebody who has known me but not seen me day to day and say, okay, compared to the geeky kid who didn't really like to look people in the eye uh, when he was 20 years old, what is, and what's the big difference? But between I, him and the guy that sat next yeah. to the president last night? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was fun. So, so it was, uh, I don't know. I mean, one of the things that still makes Linux interesting for me is, A, that technical challenges keep on changing. So we still do relevant technical work. I mean, there's no question about that. But part of it is my, my work has also changed. I don't do programming anymore. I have had to make things like Git and try to make process changes so that we work scale better as a community. Uh, and these days I do, most of what I do is communication. I mean, I, what I do is I read email, I pull people's changes, or I tell people that, no, this is too ugly to live, please go away and never approach me ever again. <laughs> so, so that's kind of what I do. And, and that has changed over time, and that has kept the whole thing interesting for me. And I think for, I mean, there's, there's literally people involved in Linux development who I remember coming in in maybe even late 91 and certainly early 92. So there are other peoples who have been involved over 20 years. 
Back Not many, there. but... Oh, okay, back there and then to the front row here. Uh, hello, my name is Miguel. I run uh, an open source. Uh, Can you company. speak a little louder? Uh, I'm Miguel. I run a, an open source company based in Portugal, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering uh, about the state of patent wars uh, around companies. Oh. If you are going to do uh, Linux again, the kernel again, what license would you choose now? Uh, the one choice I'm really still very, very happy about is the license choice. Now, admittedly, the DPL version 2 is not the original license. The original license was something I wrote and was like three lines of code, and it says, you may not charge money for it. If you make changes, you have to send them back to me. Maybe it was only two lines. <laughs> I can't remember. C1 so, and 2. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but I'm completely convinced the GPL ver version 2 is the right license. And that doesn't mean that it's the perfect license. It's, it's still legalese, and it's still, there's gray areas in the license, and it could, have been, it could have been better. But I really very deeply agree with the things laid out in the GPL version 2, even though I then very deeply disagree with most of the stuff that comes out of Richard Stallman's mouth. <laughs> so the two are not in any way, I mean, you don't have to agree with Richard Stallman to still like GPL version 2, right? Uh, so I would not change, I mean, I would not change the license, that's for sure. There might be other things I would do differently, but I can't think of them either. Okay. Okay. Is yeah. it on? Um, do you think Linux is in good hands so that if you decide today not to touch the computer anymore, it would go on and on? So, um, show of hands, how many are of you are involved in an open source project that is not the current? Okay, a fair number. How many of you have a core team that is more than 10 people? There's one, ten, maybe another tentative hand. The normal size for most open source projects are three people, roughly. I mean, there may be people here. I mean, there were a couple of hands that had more than 10 people. Maybe there would be a, some more that had more than five. In the kernel, we have 50 really I mean, 50 people who are very, very core. Every single release, every three months, we have a thousand people involved that send us patches. There's the kernel development community, and I do not know why, is the deepest development community in the open source area by far. I mean, by two orders of magnitude often. And uh, if I disappeared tomorrow, there would be, I mean, there, we'd all have to raise the flag to half mast, and, and it would be really sad, but nobody would even notice in the kernel community. <laughs> right. And not quite true, but there's a lot of people who, I mean. The master, but the decision making is between the thousands in like the. Uh, it's not that. I make decisions, but quite frankly, most of the real work is done by many people. Uh, the there's many layers of decisions even before most code ever reaches me. And there are at least three or four of the core developers that can take over my work and do take over my work when I go on vacations occasionally. Right. It, when I go away for a week, I don't even bother. I just, just let people know that, hey, please, we're not in the merge window. Just don't bother me too much because I'll I'll be away. But if I go away for two weeks, I tell people like Greg and David and Andrew and a couple of other people that, hey, I'm gone for two weeks, you're in charge. So I have at least four people who are like, they, they can do what I do. In fact, Greg largely does do what I do. And they, if you know who Greg is, you know who Greg is. If you don't, you don't care. So I'm not. <laughs> Good. Okay, there's one in the middle. Oh, hi. Uh, although you said 
you're like really technical person and you're interested in programming and yeah. you're not interested in some of the stuff like user interface and other stuff. But you know, whatever you say kind of influences quite a lot on all those fields. For mm -hmm. instance, you said you didn't really like GNOME 3 interface and people are all going like, whoa, Linus says, you know, GNOME 3 is crap and something like that. So how do you feel about your influence in those kind of fields that you're not interested in? So sometimes I'm a bit upset that people take what I say a bit too seriously. And, and then, then five minutes later I said, screw that. I don't care, <laughs> right? I like that people take me seriously, but at the same time I refuse to then let that mean that I don't say what I mean. I mean, I've always wanted to be very honest in my, uh, my statements. Uh, I use strong language on the internet to the point where some people feel offended and that's their problem. I, uh, I actually think that especially in a community like uh, open source, other developers need to know how I feel about things. I'm not I'm impolite because I'm impolite. I mean, I'm not making excuses for that. But I also actually believe that when, when you work with a lot of people, it's better to be really open about your feelings so that you don't have people who, by mistake, misread you. Uh, I've had that happen. I, I have literally had developers who were working on things that I didn't really like, but I didn't shut down early enough. They worked on it for a long time. They felt that it was ready. They submitted it to me. Uh, and I said, no, this is horrible. Because at that point, I had to make a decision. And uh, in at least one of those cases, I had some other friends basically email me later and saying the guy is suicidal. Right? I mean, I, and that's not my fault, but at the same time, I. I, I, if I'm open early on and saying, hey, this is going down a direction that I don't like, I think that's actually healthier for everybody involved instead of me stringing people around, along and trying to be polite. So partly it's my personality. I am blunt and I am from Finland and I tell people <coughs> what I feel like. But partly it's actually a conscious choice to say, no, I'm not going to tone it down just because somebody might be hurt. Thank so. you. Interesting. OK, over here. Yeah. <coughs> so many things happen. Um, Linux was accidental. Git was accidental. What is Git, your... actually, I'm proud of Git. I want yes. to say this. Yes, uh, but it was accidental. It was. The fact that I had to write Git was accidental, yes. but Linux, the design came from a great mind, and that great mind was not mine. I mean, you have to give credit for the design of Linux to Cunningham and Ritchie and, and Thompson. Uh, I mean, there's, there, there's a reason I like Unix and why I wanted to redo it. I do want to say that Git is a design that is mine and unique, and I'm proud of the fact that I can damn well also do a good design from scratch. Okay, yeah. now you can so go. What's, <laughs> so what's the latest accidental thing that you work on? <laughs> I may have to come back to that, because I can't. <laughs> I mean, we've had a lot of stuff that was accidental. I mean, the fact that, uh, for example, that we do fairly well in cell phones and that multi-core in cell phones is actually important now and we're really good at it, was an accidental result of the fact that we happened to do supercomputers 10 years ago. Uh, so there's those kinds of accidents that happen that are accidents because different people work on different kind of projects and it turns out that five years after the fact there were actually things that connected them that nobody ever saw coming, right? And that's, that's been a huge success of Linux and I think that's interesting from a technical standpoint how important it has been for Linux to actually have one single kernel for every single device out there. 
I don't think people, and I didn't actually think it would be possible, but if you look at every single other operating system out there ever, nobody has ever done that before. Look at Apple. They have separate operating systems for, the, for their low-end devices and their high-end devices. Look at uh, Microsoft. Same thing. They're claiming that they're uh, trying to merge them in Windows 8. They're lying. They're not. They're full of shit. The only... <laughs> but Linux is... No, but, and it, it turns out we did it because uh, I actually care about beauty and it turns out it was nicer to do it the way Linux did it. And it's a unique thing in Linux and it's a big strength because it turns out there's often these kinds of uh, accidental uh, technical connections that people didn't believe in at the time but then things changed and, and now cell phones have the same issues that supercomputers have. Hi, I'm uh, interested in the time that you spent at the university uh, back oh. in the early days. And uh, I know that you were at least briefly a member of a research group. And I was wondering what kind of experience that was. And I know that you did some teaching assistancies, which turned out to be surprisingly beneficial in meeting your wife and so on. Oh. But <laughs> <laughs> I was all over the map. I loved being at the university. I really liked the university uh, for many reasons. Like, I, I assume most of you are technical people from, well, now Aalto University. So you think the university people are like these theoretical nerds that are useless for any real work. I love the, the, the uh, abstract side of, of the computer science uh, at Helsinki University, which is very different from, I think, the computer science here at TKK or Aalto. Uh, I loved Spectrum. Uh, the only time I really was over here was when we were in the pink coveralls and, and ran around drinking beer. Uh, <laughs> I was a TA at university. I did, uh, I did uh, a stint for half a year or a year in the Henry Theatres Research Group. It was interesting and it means that, yes, it took me like nine years to get a, a master's degree, which you were pretty fast then. Yeah, well, you're, you're supposed to be faster. I will say that one of the, it wasn't quite nine years, I think it was eight and a half. One of the years was literally me just, I could, forcing myself to write the thesis. I had everything ready and I'm one of the, I, there's a lot of people like that. I know I've heard other people have exactly the same issue that you have everything done and the only thing you have less left is the writing of the, your final thesis. And uh, one of the impetus for, the, for actually moving to the U.S. was I got a, when I got a job offer, I was saying, okay, this will finally force me to do my thesis because I, I refuse to, to leave that university half done. So, so I, I actually didn't get my, the papers from Helsinki University until after I already moved to the U.S., but I had finalized everything. I enjoyed the university life and I did a lot of different things. And, and uh, for those of you who are young enough to still be studying, hey, enjoy the hell out of that time because it was some of my favorite time. Well, can, I, can I ask a uh, continuation on that? Why, mm -hmm. why didn't you follow the academic side any further? Oh, what? it's easy. I, uh, you noticed I had trouble writing my thesis? <laughs> I, I love being at the university, but I hate writing papers. I'm, I'm not actually bad at it. I'm, I'm a, I think I am a reasonably good writer. I have a hard time getting started. I want to have, when I write something, I want to have like a point to my writing. I want it to flow. And if I don't see exactly how I get from the beginning to the end, and, uh, and make it all make sense, I can't get started, or I have a very hard time getting started. And quite frankly, if you don't like writing papers, you should not stay at the university. And I mean, I realized that and said, it had been my, uh, I, I used to think that I would be a scientist and stay at university. And uh, I realized, no, I, I just don't like writing papers. I don't really like teaching. Uh, I have to go to the industry. And I loved going to a startup. 
So if any of you ever get the chance, startups that are early in their startup career, when they're still doing the early technical stuff and they do not see where it's going and, and everybody's really gung-ho, are absolutely a wonderful work experience. I was at Transmeta for seven years and five of those years were wonderful. And then when <laughs> the IPO was getting closer, it suddenly changed from not being so much about the technology and suddenly you had to worry about customers and you had to worry about money and, and IPO issues and suddenly it wasn't fun anymore. Just I stayed on for a while and then I said, no, this is not what I signed up for. Just a quick uh, last question. Uh, did you get any support uh, for Linux from the university and would you have liked some? I, I did, and there's a Finnish saying, and I don't remember the saying, but there's a Finnish saying that you, you should not stand up because you get cut down. What's the saying? Okay. I'm sure there is, because I've heard it, I've heard actual Finnish people ask me that wasn't it uncomfortable to, to stand out? Didn't people try to put you down and try to make you part of the same gray mass as everybody else. And I had absolutely the reverse experience at Helsinki University. Uh, the, it wasn't like they were... There was not a lot of special support, but every, all the people were very happy about me running my experimental stuff on the university network. And, and they were really happy when we did the, I mean, as just an example, a small detail, when we did the 1.0 release in 94 or something, the university wanted to give us the like, big uh, main auditorium at the computer science uh, building. And they, I mean, everybody was really nice. And, and they, there was a lot of, the computer science department got an alpha-based machine because they realized that I was porting Linux to the alpha and they thought, this is an interesting project. There was actually a lot of support. But it wasn't like official support, but in, within the uh, computer science department, I think people in general were really nice. And uh, the whole, sure, it was odd. I mean, they, everybody inside the university realized how odd it was that something practical came out of the computer science <laughs> lab. But, but at the same time, it was, it was like, that's cool. I didn't know we could do that. So it was, it was fun. I really liked Helsinki University. I mean, I'm sure I would have uh, liked TF too, but I, uh, I had a great time at Helsinki University. Great. Okay. I have a question over here. Juho? Oh, no, you haven't. Okay. okay. Uh, so, uh, short backstory on the, uh, so to explain my question is like, I got myself a two years ago a laptop that had uh, uh, two graphic cards. It had an Intel and an NVIDIA and it had the famous Optimus chip that was difficult to operate from Linux. And I saw at the beginning, I was like expecting to get support at some point and it was kind of difficult at the beginning. and. Full support came something like a half a year ago with one project that's on GitHub that's working pretty nice. Mm -hmm. But what I saw that uh, at some point I was kind of expecting that maybe NVIDIA would uh, kind of chip in and do something for it. And they said flat out, no, we're not doing any support. And I was like, well, we're playing in the same sandbox. Why can't be nice to each other? It's like, uh, like things like this that we cannot have uh, the hardware producers think about the, the, the other stuff as well. Yes. Because they're, they're like hard set on that you cannot really uh, think, uh, cooperate with them on this. It's like, what, what's your uh, comment on this, that kind of situation? Um, so I, I, would say I know exactly what you're talking about. And I'm very happy to say that uh, it's the exception rather than the rule. And I'm also happy to very publicly point out that NVIDIA has been one of the worst trouble spots we've had with hardware manufacturers. And that is really sad because NVIDIA tries to sell chips, a lot of chips, into the Android market. And NVIDIA has been the single worst company we've ever dealt with. So NVIDIA, fuck you. <laughs> Whew. 
making some friends there. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that other companies are perfect either. We, we, we have had companies that just don't care. We've had companies that felt that Linux wasn't a big enough market. We've had, uh, we'd have situations like that. At the same time, there's a lot of companies that have been very helpful since very early days. And it's, I think it's very sad when you sell hardware and you actually use Linux and you're being really difficult about it. And, and I really, yes, I'm, I'm sad when it happens. We can't do anything about it, but it's life. I wish everybody was as nice as I am. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Which, okay. So, all right, I, I, I want to bring up a kind of like an open source movement of a little bit different kind, and, and this, this comes up because of the university uh, connection here. And that's kind of like open courseware. There are lots of like developments like, okay, MIT uh, open courseware, and then the US uh, company uh, Coursera by some famous people that offer kind of like open classrooms for 100,000 people and so on. So, do you care, take a care, do you care to take a to guess how this market will or this kind of open source work will go forward. And I have a really hard time really making any judgment, but I do think it's really interesting how... Uh, it's not just Linux, but uh, there's been other... Like, the openness of the Linux development model has clearly kind of made some people stand up and think, uh, how can we use this in our area? And and um, sometimes it's been in odd places, but, but I like, for example, the open coursework is wonderful. I love the discussion that a lot of scientists have about uh, open publications. And, uh, and that kind of thinking, I think, is very healthy, but I, I can't answer your question. I don't know how it's going to work out. Okay, here, hey. Hanna. Oh, oh, no, you could... It is on. Yeah. Yep. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, uh, most of the people who used computers, they had some kind of clue that what is the code, like what they're using, and also many of them were c like making code themselves. But nowadays, like most of the people in Western world are using computers, but they don't have any clue that what is in <laughs> in the computer and what is the code. So what do you think that would be said in chil uh, for children in elementary school that could make them think that they also can make their own, tool own mm. tools? Great question. So I'm of the opinion that one of the great strengths we have as humans, as a species, is how good we are at specializing. And if you think about all the progress we've made, we've largely made it because certain people specialize in certain things and can do it much more efficiently that way. And I absolutely think that is true when it comes to things like being very technical and doing programming at a low level. Uh, I do not believe in a world where everybody, every child should be taught to program. I just don't think that makes sense. That said, what I do think makes tons of sense is to make sure that every child who has the capacity to really be passionate about programming and be one of those people who can specialize in this, those people should be encouraged and they should have the possibility of noticing that, hey, this is really good and this is really cool. So I love the projects like Raspberry Pi that make just cheap computers available because if you, if you have successful projects, I'm not saying the Raspberry Pi is going to be successful. I, I love the concept of it and, and let's see how it actually works out. But I think it's very important to have cheap throwaway, literally throwaway computers that allow people to tinker. And if that means that 99 of 100 Raspberry Pi's will basically gather dust because nobody uses them, that's fine if one of them made somebody realize, hey, this is cool, and started programming. So that's kind of my opinion, that I don't think we should try to make everybody program, but we should try to make sure that everybody 
who has an aptitude for programming should have the ability to notice and, and be noticed. Okay. Here. Okay. Yes. Hanna from Alto Center for Entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurs, they're always taught that they should have a vision for the business. So are you saying that you didn't have any vision for the Linux no. in the beginning? And do you have it now? Where is that a question coming from? I just feel very... Oh, there, you, you were sitting down. Uh, so, I tend to call myself an anti-visionary because to me, what is much more important than vision is execution. Uh, and I always quote Edison saying that genius is 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration. So you do need to have the inspiration, but in the end, uh, lots of people have ideas. It's actually finishing them and overcoming all the problems you will hit that is the sign of somebody who has a passion and really takes it all the way. Uh, that said, I, I think you, I mean, I'm the kind of person who believes in hard work and attention to detail and just doing a lot of work. I think it's probably healthy to have a certain amount of vision too. Uh, I don't think you, in, in some cases, having vision may be what gets you past the problem. My argument has often been that if you like look at the stars all the time, you will stumble over the pothole in the ground because you're not looking where you're walking. Uh, but so just because I'm a pedestrian looking at the details kind of person, maybe those visionary people do something good too. I'm not. I'm not going to argue too too bad. I, I believe more in having passion. I think really caring about what you do is way more Im important than, than having this mental vision of this golden future that you want to reach. Uh, hi. Yes. Uh, do you like to see Linux overtaking like Microsoft and Nintendo as a gaming platform? And do you expect that to happen soon? So I have to admit I don't game. I mean, I... I'd love for gaming platforms to be more open because gaming platforms tend to be those, the most closed pieces of technology you can find almost. And I think that's kind of sad because it means that they are designed to basically exclude people from trying things out. Uh, at the same time, I understand exactly why the companies are doing this whole razor blade sell the razor for cheap and, and get the money through razor blades approach. I understand why they do it, so I'm not complaining too much. Uh, it would be lovely to see more open source gaming. And it is an area where people have, I mean, spent some time. And I used to believe that open source programs were all about technical things, because that's what they used to be. You used to have open source compilers and editors and operating systems and like geeky technical things. And I used to think that's all we'll ever, ever do because developers do technical things. I was wrong. I mean, there's tons of open source programs in other areas. I don't think there's a lot of open source good games. And part of that may be that games are a lot about content and you really maybe need a different mindset about that, but I don't know. Okay, two, two more questions. One here. One here. How do you see the uh, future of open source and open innovation when, you, when we see a lot of startups coming up uh, nowadays? I mean, uh, how should uh, startups approach the open source and open in innovation movement? So I, I think if you're a startup, what you should do about open source is take advantage of it. I mean, that's really, I mean, you need that. You, you, as a startup, you need every edge you can get. And one of the edges you have is you're small and nimble and you can take open source and you can try to really tune it for whatever special needs you're aiming for. And I think s startups especially and, and new really oddball technologies that you're trying to drive that nobody has done before, 
that's when you should take advantage of open source and say, hey, we can build upon this base that is boring and does all the things that everybody has already done, and we'll add our special magic sauce on top and, and really take advantage of the open source model. And I think people do that, but I, I think they should maybe do it more consciously sometimes. Okay. Okay, last one. Yep. Hello, everybody. I'm Yuha. <laughs> <laughs> You don't know where I'm from, but I know where you are. So I have a question for the audience. How many of you were part of the big MIMO MIGO adventure? Hands up. Oh, wow. So not all of us are born evil, but I have to confess that now I joined the ranks of NVIDIA. We're now upstreaming. Oh. Take your support anyway, just to make you happy. Even though you gave me the finger, I still <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, very good. I actually, I like being outrageous at times. It's, it's amusing to see. I guarantee you, if you make that video available on the internet, there will be thousands of people who are really upset and I, you know, and offended. I like offending people because I think people who get offended should be offended. It's like... <laughs> Good. All right. Okay. Great. Okay. I, 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 we need to cut it here. So, um, wow. Fantastic stuff. Really appreciate all of you guys coming here. I want to give a couple, couple thank yous. Um, Absolutely, first to Technology Academy of Finland, Einemaya Hardelof for helping uh, us get Linus here to talk to this great thing. Um, second thing is I, I, I want to thank also the Alto Entrepreneurship Society and the Summer Startups Gang for helping here. I really, everybody here who has interest in building something of your own. Uh, you should look into the events of Alto Entrepreneurship Society and the things going on at the Alto Venture Garage. So let's give those guys a big hand. And last, we have a, a, a small uh, prize award, another, uh, not quite as big as the, uh, is, is the Millennium Prize, but we actually have another uh, fantastic organic movement that actually started from, from uh, Alto. Aren't you supposed so I'll let to Eric, throw those uh, at me? Present. Probably. Yes. I think you don't really play games with maybe for yourself. Uh, I really need three of these. Uh, okay. We'll, we'll get those. Yeah. Yeah. Rovio's a great partner to everything going on at Alto right now, so thanks a lot. And uh, we'll, as I told Linus before, we're happy to ship these yeah, things to your place. This is bigger <laughs> than I expected. Good. But, uh, and then, of course, last, uh, Linus, thanks for spending your time here. I know it's, uh, it's been a wild week, but um, hopefully this has been a good way to cap it off. Yeah, no, I enjoyed doing the question and answer sessions, so getting a, a bit more like feedback is always funny. I hope you enjoyed it, too. Good. All right, thanks.